true friend i personally experienced as her vice president foxy last year hence again decided to work with her vice president in amox she believes in inclusiveness she is an ever help colleague dedicated family person she is her own kind of beautiful join me in welcoming the most coveted dr nandita palsetkar thank you thank you thank you i think friends today is an amazing day in my life as of course i've been installed as the amox president yesterday but to deliver dr bn purandre oration i think uh, this is the ultimate honor privilege that i can get in my life and i'm forever indebted to amox to the purandre family uh, to the trustees of amox for giving me this honor i mean i cannot really really i'm getting goosebumps as i talk because it is something that we all look forward to you know dr bn purandre one of the greatest gynecologists born on this earth he was the padma bhushan and he was probably he is sorry he is the first indian to become the figo president a fantastic surgeon what can i talk about his surgery in fact the vaginal surgery that he did he converted it was not only science but i think people who have worked with him says that it was art watching him operate was like an art he was a mentor to many a very visionary philanthropist i think the amount of work that he's done was amazing i think a superman and an icon for time immemorial i think we are really blessed to have such a person in our midst and we are proud to say that he was our very own indian and a little bit of a personal take uh, everybody here you know the whole of last year i had the opportunity to work with his grandson amai and i think i see that talent i see that spark i see that vision in this young boy whom i can be proud to say that i have mentored him and nurtured him and uh, i'm sure one day he will lead this organization so am i all the best in your future but really friends today is an amazing day to be able to deliver this oration and the best part was that i'm going to be talking about how my life intertwined with ivf and how technology has taken us so far and i think dr shanta kumari's talk actually points in the right direction and here we are me marathi mulgi maharashtra chi mulgi janma jhala puneat i was born in pune and i was brought up there then i came to bombay my parents dr dy patel and my mother pushpa patel very educated people you know m a l l b my mother did sanskrit amazing influence on me and they told me you have to become a doctor bas like you know shanta said we had no choice you have to become a doctor right since i was in the fifth standard and i knew that i had to become a doctor so i just went along that line and i think that was something i feel today's children you know you tell them give them a choice you've seen three idiots let them do what they want but i think the parents are very important in guiding that mentorship that guiding because they're fresh they're young and what we as parents need to do is open up our minds you know that there are the options see how this child is and guide 17 years is too young a age to really know what you want to do so i think that's the responsibility with parents which we must have and i think my parents did fantastically well uh, during that i must tell you what happened in my first mbbs and that was my first lesson that i learned you know first mbbs admission on merit we were enjoying bunking classes we were a class of 200 150 used to go for a movie and the final term came and i didn't get a form to apply they said sorry your attendance is incomplete you have to call your parents my mother sorry i'm not coming you take your father father la the ashe ghabrayto mujhe ashe thar 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 ka payto i said oh my god what to do then finally i de developed courage and took him and all and when he went over there he said you know all the parents begging give her a child is good my father goes there and he says don't give her the form let her repeat 6 months oh my god he said something that has remained in my mind forever she does not value what 
she has got. A student has lost a seat because this girl, this child has got the merit seat. You need to teach her a lesson. That was a lesson I never forgot. I, my values, my discipline, which is there in my life, started as early as first MBBS, and I really have to thank my father for it. And then, of course, so, you know, I finished my. MD and I met Dr. Rishikesh Pai. He's my friend, philosopher, and guide, and I actually got into IVF. So I think that was a turning point in my life where it happened. But I must tell you about my MD years, just in short. You know, MD, I was doing OPD in one OPD. It used to be uh, half the OPD used to come, I don't want this child, I want an abortion. And half the OPD used to come, I want a child desperately. In those days, I used to think, can I pick this up and put this child here? You know, that thought process evolved in my mind and that is where my whole empathy came for the patients and I wanted to you know uh, help people and I think that has served me in the long run friends y'all are good y'all are privileged please help whenever you can you know, today, as a Fox, uh, Amox president, I've received so many uh, uh, requests that I want to work with you, I want to work with you. And I have decided that whoever has approached me till now, I'm taking all of them. Beyond that, I cannot accommodate the others, they'll kick me out of Amox. But I think that was important, and I met my teachers, KK Deshmukh. You know, I had given up medicine, because my mother-in-law died, I had a son who was sitting at home, uh, he was one and a half year old, I could not go to work, and I was a resident that time. And KK Deshmukh, my men, my everything, godmother, she called me back and she said, Nandita, parat ye, tu ka vaya ghalote? I mean, today I would have probably been, you know, director at some medical college, but not here with you. And I would have missed out the passion of my life. So she is one major influence on me who got me back and said, you are good, you need to do this. And you need people like that. That's where I learned in life that, you know, people, I was very down and she gave me a hand. She gave me a second chance. And giving second chances is very important, especially even in your practice. Give your patient a second chance. I think it works very well. Dr. C. N. Purandre held my hand when I did my first section. All the surgical skills have come from him. And Dr. Lopez has always been my friend. She's always listened to me and helped me out in a lot of situations. So whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And friends, that's what we need to remember, that if you want it, you can do it. And it's so, so important. When I was a student, I had dilemmas. You know, there was contraception, which was really hot at that time in 1990s. And conception was a new technique, new technology. You know, it was like, but it was not that uh, popular. Technique, I saw all these fabulous surgeons operating. And I was so impressed by their surgical skills. And there was technology here of IVF, which was beckoning me, you know. And the other thing that I had to decide was whether to get into clinical practice or do super specialization. I think that was a dilemma in my mind. And that's when I decided to opt for IVF. And I think I've never looked back. And that's where Dr. Pai came in. We have a partnership of 28 years. And we've done nearly 10 IVF centers, and we haven't looked back. One thing that has come out of this partnership, remember, if you ever want to go ahead in life, you have to be honest with each other, and you have to let go. You know, sometimes I've lost 50,000 rupees. We can't account for it. He'll say, forget it. We both will, you know, bear the loss. Partnership is the way to go in the future. And I think you have to let go. You have to trust each other. And you should never, never. And why? And, we, you know, we are always, like, we have to remain on the top. We are the best. But that innovation, that hunger for technology, I think your talk was fantastic. That hunger for technology, especially in IVF, is really important. And now I'm going to take you through a different journey. You know, I'm going to talk about what was 25 years ago and how those discoveries led to what is happening today. I think that would be something all of us can learn from. 1978, all of us know the year. A year that changed everything on this earth. In fact, there was a first online chat system. You know, then Sony invented the Walkman. What was it? Today's iPods, today's Instagram, today's Facebook. That is what happened in 1978, and today we see that. But what was the biggest discovery? 
after the best was of course that the man walked on the moon neil armstrong walked on the moon that's amazing but ivf was the next best thing that the world got i mean can you imagine creating life outside the body in 1978 and in fact they got the nobel prize also for it so it was amazing if you look at art you know things have changed that's why i'm taking you through the old papers look at this what are the factors governing success rate maternal age year in which the cycle is performed this is a 2005 study 15 years ago number of embryos type of catheter embryologists today let me tell you even age does not matter how you ask me how the technology of genetic diagnosis has come if you have a 42 year old with a normal embryo she has the same pregnancy rate as a 30 year old so you use technology you do genetic analysis and you give her the same success rate because the uterus is the same whether you are 20 30 or 60 i think this is something that we all need to accept we all need to absorb that today you can do a lot with patients even if they are older you can help them out and they don't have to go through negative cycles more and more you know do the diagnosis get the embryo what are the challenges that we face today success rate has to be consistent you don't want a young 25 year old to have morbidity of ohs to die of ohs enhancing success rate in difficult clinical scenarios single till pregnancy you know my driver just conceived twins and i am seeing that poor man struggle with everything even to get diapers it costs so much money we don't realize what we are doing you know people come to us and say they want twins but you have to realize forget the part financial part afterwards look at the high risk pregnancies that we are creating so we need to really work towards singleton pregnancies reducing of course aneuploidy new and cost effectiveness i think that is our social responsibility which we know so what else we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not a habit is not an act but a habit let me tell you give you the example of sachin tendulkar i'm a big fan of cricket okay in 2000 australian test series shane warne was coming and sachin was really scared of him ki you know he was a terror he was a terror you know what sachin did he practiced day and night with all the different types of leg spinners in our country he practiced day and night and he annihilated shane warne that he did by continuous practice and you know what shane was says he says my god sachin is a nightmare that's what sachin did and that's what we need to do we need to do our work so beautifully that we want excellence every day and believe me ivf is that it's excellence every day because one step goes wrong and your pregnancy rate drops so i think it's very very important that you need to have focus persistence and hard work and these are the qualities that i've learned from my journey with ivf individual stimulation i think individualization of therapy is very important and this is what your ivf specialist can do you know there are lots of things the amh the antral follicle count the bmi <coughs> all these the age they all go towards individualizing your patient's treatment and individualization matters to everyone today i talk about bipin i say hi to him he loves it asha is sitting there bhaskar is sitting there you know individual it makes any person feel good when you're singled out so use it in your practice treat each patient individually and that patient will never leave you and you will get best results use all the technology use all the knowledge i think we are very lucky foxy amogs you know we are distributing knowledge so many kols are talking all the time i think we should use it and individualize our treatment you know the poor responders the normal responders the hyper responders what this did was it bought everything into perspective reduced uh, the risks to the patient and got better results should we transfer on day 2 day 3 or day 5 i think this is a favorite paper of mine gardner in 2000 at that time he graded the blastocyst imagine this was 19 years ago and today we still use his 
classification. He was a man with a vision. This was a paper which is actually still being used today. And I think these are some of the things that have led to a lot of progress in our field. Sequential or double transfer. Um, myself and Dr. Pai, we do double transfers. You know, we do day three and day five transfers. And believe me, we've published, we've got data, we've published a paper which says the pregnancy rate is superb in recurrent IVF failures, those who have repeated failures. And I'm hoping after 25 years, one of the youngsters will quote me as the paper before. <laughs> but really, it's an amazing technology. And I think the passion for giving pregnancy is so very important. Can we achieve an OHSS free clinic? I think this paper by, um, you know, Dev Roy, it was amazing. In IVF, the only problem that we had was ovarian hyperstimulation. And by segmenting the, uh, uh, the patient, we have achieved OHSS free clinic. So today, IVF has become really safe. You know, you can't have a morbidity or a mortality in a 25 to 35 year old. And that is what the technology has advanced and Devroy achieved this. You use a GNRH antagonist protocol, you trigger with the GNRH agonist, you freeze all, you do a stage transfer and segmentation approach is what he recommended. Freeze all. Suddenly there was a huge human cry, freeze all. You know, everybody should freeze because pregnancy rates are better. But this meta-analysis actually put you properly in space that for, no, for hyper-responders it's good. Now, you will be asking me why. Remember, where it's life you're creating. Whatever you do less to the embryo is always better. So less manipulation is always better. So use it only where it's needed. Relevance of the sperm. Did any of you all know that semen analysis or male factor did not exist before 1950? There was nothing in this world that actually said that male can cause infertility. 1950, this paper actually studied 1,000 samples of men who were fertile and infertile <coughs> and came up with the parameters. I mean, uh, see how science progresses. Today you take it for granted, male factor 50%. 1950, we had no clue about it. And these are the great people who have done this. And I'm so happy to be delivering the BN Purandri oration on these aspects where we are talking about the greats who have brought about a difference in our practice. Then Kruger, I had the opportunity to do a paper with Kruger. When he came, he said 4% morphology is normal. And today, the WHO, this was 1980s, I think, when he did, yeah, 88. Today, the WHO says 4% is normal. See how good they were in those age, and we are still using this particular parameter. High serum FS levels. You know, we have patients with Sertoli cell only syndrome. We have patients with high FSH. Do their micro TISA and they will get sperms. In fact, the 2020 January fertility sterility issue, the first pages that use technology with this micro TISA, do a sperm, high resolution ultrasound. You can identify the seminiferous vesicles which are turgid, and those are the ones which should, should be picked under microscope. So see how much we are progressing and how we are helping. Of course, male factor has always been a problem. So there was MC, there was Max, spindle check. We, have, we are using a lot of microfluidics. And believe me, in a lot of patients, giving us very good quality sperms. It gives you a chromosomally normal sperm. Spindle check. This is very, very uh, crucial. Because what this does is, it's a poloscope where the Raman effect of the rays are on that egg and while injecting you can identify the spindle. Spindle is chromosome. Can you imagine if you damage that spindle, your embryo will not give you a baby. And especially in patients who have frozen the eggs for, uh, you know, cancer or those who have low re egg reserve, you've got only four or five eggs, you don't want to damage them. Here is where technology comes and helps you achieve better results. I think the movie is on a click. You see that white spot? The glow is where the chromosomes are and you inject it on the opposite side. Of course, exciting. Men, we may not need you in the future. 
the rat sperm has already been created in the lab and we may you know there is lots of studies being done lots of experiments being done with the sperm so in future sex will be for enjoyment not for procreation because for procreation people will use the labs and i'm going to talk about that also so cryopreservation was another amazing thing you know when the oc pill was discovered it was the greatest discovery why because women were empowered it gave women the right to not have a baby and it was a major revolution in the in the states but if you see today in this particular paper that elective fertility preservation which i keep talking about you know egg freezing for is a women's empowerment tool it gives the woman independence it gives the woman power to decide when she wants to have a child because of the biological clock that we have ticking and it's definitely going to change a lot of lives in future and i want you to embrace this technology because we are a little reluctant but no friends like the oral contraceptive pills this is also here to stay to empower women and of course she's a prime example of empowered women diana hayden she froze her eggs for 8 years and now she has three children from those eggs at the age of 42 and 44 success does not consist in never making mistakes but in never making the same one a second time and that is what ivf is all about you know we are always troubleshooting we are always finding ways and means sometimes it's the tarring on the road which is being done outside and that causes a drop in your pregnancy rates so air handling units came in i think the epigenetic effects of the environment is what we need to worry about and that's why air handling units are so important how do we select the best embryo this was a beautiful paper i know my son rohan said mama don't talk about this it's too high fi but i want you to understand that before this paper came i don't remember the date but people thought abnormal embryos abnormalities were because they were genetic they were from the origin of the gametes but this paper actually says that environment affects it the culture conditions in which you keep affects it and that is where a lot of change came about in the lab and the lab became important so embryoscope it's uh, time lapse photography all of you all have it on your phones you just switch it on and the pictures taken every 15 minutes and beautiful algorithms are developed and today there are so um, there are uh, papers now in fact i forgot in the poloscope also you can identify aneuploidies so there are papers which are coming to say that this technology is working beautifully and that is what i've told my lab people now to do poloscope in every egg see the bifringin see the uh, spindle and give the pregnancy rate endometrial dating everybody was very fond of it it came in 1950 today we think it's obsolete no but it is the basis of era you know we've got used technology to advance it was only histopathology now you're studying genes to see if the endometrium is good and that is what technology has done to us alice analysis of infectious chronic endometritis i think this is something the microbiome is very very important and again these are the genetic studies done of these microorganisms and these tests are available we are doing it in bombay and it's really an amazing technology which should be used for difficult patients pgt pre implantation genetic testing of course testing the genes of the baby so that we know it's normal you can diagnose aneuploidies you can diagnose monogenic diseases you can diagnose structural uh, abnormalities and that is what pgt is all about and it helps us help patients with recurrent failures with recurrent abortions they need it today morning i saw a patient who had three abortions that patient definitely and remember now you know you're doing karyotype of the husband and wife it's obsolete because today you have ngs that's next gen sequencing that is what the couple requires extended genetic carrier testing the karyotype really even when you send your pocs for karyotype today because the technology was not there it was okay but today with that technology it's become obsolete actually so how you have to change in your practice it is expensive so i need to counsel all my patients before i do it 
And this is my baby right now. You know, non-invasive chromosome testing. You do NIPT for all your women. There is cell-free DNA which goes from the baby into the mother's cell. Similarly, the embryo secretes cell-free DNA into the fluid. And that is what we've done. You know, we've analyzed 150 embryos, taken the fluid and taken a biopsy, and 80% accuracy is there. And 20% we've not got results, so they're abnormal. So I think it's a technology. I'm doing it for most of the patients now, where I don't touch the embryo. It's non-invasive. The embryo is lying there, beautiful blastocyst. We freeze it, and we take this fluid and send it for testing for genes. I think it's a wonderful technology. Then comes CRISPR. You know, uh, this is gene editing. Now what happens is when the embryo comes abnormal, we throw it away. But with CRISPR, you can edit the genes. And it's a fantastic technology which is available and uh, we have attended a workshop with it. And it's fantastic. It's really amazing. Dr. He from China delivered uh, one set of twins who are HIV free. They can never get the HIV virus infection. So, but of course he's in jail because a lot of ethical issues. I attended a conference in New York where they're creating an ovary. She created a 3D scaffolding by a 3D printer, put in primordial follicles and created the ovary. So patients with cancer where you've taken away the ovary, you can actually create eggs outside the body. And believe me, it's happening. It's not science fiction. It is happening and we need to be aware of all these things. This is a beautiful book. All of us IVF specialists are very fond of it. Aldous Huxley, 1932, described IVF as sci-fi. That, you know, it can happen, we can create babies outside and all. And the last page in his book was exogenesis. You know, in Japan, the lamb has been grown outside for six months. It's amazing. And that is what we need to understand. That maybe, you know, Alpesh, we may not need the HDUs. <laughs> We need biomechanical engineers. Maternal mortality will be zero. But of course, that's a different generation and we will see. And I think I would like to end by saying my reason for being here. Medicine, service, ethics, dedication is something that we love, we are good at, and they are the pillars of our life. And what the world needs from us is a combination of all this. And this, that is what Amox is going to give you, because that is your reason for li living. That is your reason for being a doctor. And I think it's a noble profession, will always be noble. And we all, somewhere down in our hearts, have that corner. And I think when each one discovers it, it'll be a beautiful world to live in. Unconditional support. I have to say thank you to my family. My husband is an amazing human being. I mean, he is really so proud of me. And, you know, I could not have asked for a better partner in life, really. And my family, my son also, unconditional support. I mean, he's just there with me night and day doing my work. My granddaughter, Zuri. I'm a grandmother. Yay, I love that. And she's amazing. And this young team of mine who actually works a lot with me. And Karishma, my daughter-in-law, who's an oncosurgeon. Uh, my brothers and my father, I mean, they've had, they've always pushed me towards excellence. I think it's amazing to have this kind of a bond that we all have and we all share. And my team, I think the Bloom IVF team is so fantastic. We are, we are 200 plus people in the family. And it's amazing when we all get together. This is only the Bombay group some time ago and it, they have supported me throughout. I cannot talk without these people. Amai Purandre, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> he's really well given, he's really given everything, the whole of last two years to me. And I really appreciate it and I wish you all the best. Rohan, son, you know, he's the only one who can fight back with me. So <laughs> Amai and Pratik, why are Rohan used to tell me sometimes that this is not correct. But amazing team and Pratik, thank you very much for being there with me. So I just want to say, Thank you. Long live Amogs. Long live India. And Jai Maharashtra. Thank you. We have a surprise for ma'am. So we've got Dr. Saili. And we would request you to keep the mic on. <laughs> and can we have the slides that Dr. Saili has prepared? Wow. And next slide. Cool, calm, confident, a doting mother, a loving wife. 
and having many beautiful family. This is all what we know about Nandita Bhai. But just one word from that we want to listen from her. Huh? What was more fun to be, ma'am, at school or at home? Uh, actually, I really enjoyed school because I was a very naughty child. Every time in the Hindi class, I used to be standing on the stool facing the wall. Kamino kutto baat karte ho. That's what our Hindi teacher used to call us. I mean, school was really fun. I loved school. <laughs> what is the most naughtiest prank you have done till date? Oh my God. <laughs> oh God, what to tell you now? Uh, you know, um, um, my husband and his sister had actually come to my house and uh, there was, uh, you know, chole bature with that patta, kari, that leaf which is there, you know, curry leaf. That was there in that curry patta and first time my husband had come and everything and uh, I love your clean plate, you know, thing. So we told him, nothing doing, you have to put a clean plate. If you don't clean that plate, my father will not agree to the marriage. The poor man ate the kari patta. <laughs> So that's something really crazy things we've done with him. <laughs> Next one. Whom are you scared of? Oh my God. Let me tell you. I'm 50 plus, okay? But I had a party on 31st night at my father's house. Nice New Year's party and all. And I thought father was out of town. <laughs> He came back at 9.30, you know, and all my friends, music, DJ, dhamal going on. Party got over at 1, at 2 o'clock they were cleaning up. My father came out like that. I actually hid under the table. So I am scared of him. I am scared of him. What did you want to be first in? Rich or famous? <laughs> oh, what did I want to be? I wanted to be Nandita. <laughs> You bump college often, is it true? <laughs> yes, I'm an outstanding gynecologist even today. <laughs> I love to be out of the hall. <laughs> when did you start planning for being Foxy president? That was something I always dreamt of right since I joined MOGS. I always wanted to reach that goal and I think it was a focus. I worked towards it and I'm happy because I used to see Dr. C. N. Purandre, Dr. Lopez, then Dr. Pai fighting elections and all. And I said I have to get into it. That's my political gene, you know, which got me all. The most cherished moment of this journey. Oh, I think, you know, um, every time I fall sick, the only person I want next to me is my husband. I don't even want my mother, you know, when she was there. So I think that shows the kind of dependence I have on him and he will do everything for me, you know, everything. And I'm like a child, like a little doll, he will just pamper me. So I think uh, when I fall sick and he does that for me, I love that. What was more enjoyable, being Foxy President or Grandmom? That's a tough question to ask an empowered woman. <laughs> I think I enjoyed both. I loved both. And that's my personality, you know. I enjoy everything that I do. I can multitask at many things and I love, you know, I shifted my home, uh, office to my home. And that way, I used to come home at one o'clock. All these guys, a man all used to be home. And my granddaughter used to be sitting on my lap and talking. In fact, I think the Sun Farmer guy Guys also know her. I mean, Anthony and Rashmi were there. They've come for all meetings. They know her. So it's being both. Yes, I can. I love both. The, and Foxy presidency was the best. <laughs> if you were granted one wish, what would you ask for? Uh, you know, I want to give back to society. I really want to give back. And I've done a lot in Foxy. I want to do a lot in Amogs. But if I I'm in a position to give back. I think that is something I would really love to do and uh, uh, motivate everybody to give back. I think that's what our society needs at this point. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I now request the chairperson to please.